Good afternoon, Reyes participants, and welcome to your next session, which is People of Color in STEM. We are glad that you're able to join us today. Institutions like ODU seek to attract top faculty and researchers from around the world because we believe that providing students and fellow faculty with exposure to diversity of thought promotes creativity and innovation and fosters inclusion. When people from different backgrounds, ethnicities, and experiences come together, they look at scientific inquiry in new ways. And with their talent, curiosity, creativity, and hard work, they have the potential to make discoveries that will transform the world in advanced science. In the United States, the reality is that women and people of color are underrepresented in STEM. And for those of you who are joining us from countries outside of the US, the term people of color may be new to you. What we mean by this is that people of non-white or non-Caucasian backgrounds, so those are people of African-American, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American descent, are the minority of our population. And along with women, they're underrepresented in the STEM field. Because people of color are underrepresented in the fields of science and engineering in the US, we don't always hear the stories of the incredible scientists, engineers, and innovators who are women or people of color. And as a consequence, aspiring scientists and engineers may not see themselves represented in the STEM fields. So the goal of this panel today is to share with you the stories of some of our distinguished faculty who are people of color. So you can hear about their career journeys and hopefully be inspired to pursue your dreams of becoming a scientist, a mathematician, or an engineer one day. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our distinguished panelists. We have Alvin Holder, who is an associate professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Old Dominion University. He is um, also the director of the Monarch Maximizing Access to Research Careers program. And previously, he was an assistant professor in chemistry at the University of Southern Mississippi and a faculty member at the University of the West Indies and Cave Hill campus. Um, so currently, he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in organic chemistry, bioinorganic, and natural products chemistry, where students learn abroad in Jamaica. Welcome, Dr. Holder. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Orlando Ajala who's an associate professor of mechanical engineering technology. Dr. Ajala received a bachelor's in science and mechanical engineering from Universidad de Oriente in Venezuela and a master of science and a PhD both from the University of Delaware. Prior to ODU, Dr. Ajala held a faculty position at Universidad de Oriente where he taught and developed courses for a number of subjects such as fluid mechanics, heat transfer, thermodynamics, multi-phase flows, hydraulic machinery, Oh, that's a mouthful, <laughs> as well as different <laughs> laboratory courses. Additionally, Dr. Ordala has had the opportunity to work for a number of engineering consulting companies, which have given him an important perspective and exposure to the industry. Dr. Ordala has provided service to professional organizations such as ASME, a member of the Committee of Spanish Translation of ASME Codes. His work has been presented in several international forums in Austria, the USA, Venezuela, Japan, France, Mexico, and Argentina. Next, please welcome Nuru Jawara, who is Associate Professor of Mathematics and Statistics. Nuru Jawara, is, um, his current research interests are on multivariate and functional data analysis, modeling and probability theory, and its applications in biostatistics and time series. His work applies to discrete choice modeling, spatiotemporal models, and on statistical pattern recognitions using copula. He has been collaborating with researchers in the engineering, health sciences, oceanography, and psychology. Dr. Jawara supports support is in the statistical design and methodology studies, size power calculations and research activities, and has served as a collaborative investigator on applied grants study implementation. Much of the data analysis and dissemination in, is through publications, presentations, and mentoring and training of students. And our final panelist is Karina Arcaute. She's a senior lecturer and director of the first, engineer, first year engineering program at ODU. Um, she also is, uh, she's currently assistant professor of STEM education and professional studies in industrial technology, which is part of the Darden College of Education at ODU. 
Um, she's teaching in the area of STEM education, medical, agricultural, and biotech. Before this position, she worked for ODU's Office of Research as a grant development specialist and a research coordinator in uh, WM Keck Center for 3D Innovation at the University of Texas at El Paso, Texas. She has 10 years of experience as a user and tester of different additive manufacturing technologies and materials. She has experience working with various rapid prototyping systems, including fused deposition modeling, stereolithography, and electron beam melting. So to help guide our discussion for this panel, um, I will be, I have prepared some questions in advance, which I will be displaying now on your screen. So let me go ahead and do this. As we hear from our panelists, I encourage you to send me any questions that you have through the chat, and we will answer as many of your questions at the end of the session. So we do look forward to hearing from our live audience today, and I hope you enjoy this session. So why don't we go ahead and get started with our first question for the panel. And that question is, what inspired you to pursue studies in any career in STEM? Let's start with Alvin. Hi, can you hear me clearly? Yes, thank you. Hey, you're not going to believe it, um, but when I was growing up in Barbados, my mother's first cousin, who had left to go to England for University College in London, he had a chemistry set there. You imagine when I was at primary school, I used to play around with those chemicals. And then when I went to high school, when I was 12, for some strange reason, my mother purchased this chemistry set. I don't know if her cousin saw me playing with the chemicals and so forth. But when I started chemistry in third form, my chemistry teacher, who was from Ireland, Mrs. Shea, who he rest in peace, he taught me from the time I was 13 right through to 19, even with all level chemistry, A level chemistry. And from that point, that excited me. And I remember when I was um, four form, I was watching the sixth former, you know, senior guys perform a titration with Professor for my name, direct, and I included in the conical flask. And this, this guy pointed at me, he's going to be a chemist. And I was just 14 and he put that curse on me. He's now a doctor. And then after that, everything happened. And here I am. And trust me, science was much easier than in history. But I must say though, I enjoyed it and I passed just like I passed chemistry, I passed Spanish. So Spanish and chemistry were my best subjects. England was my last, least best subject. But I wish I could have done Spanish as I did chemistry, but we had a choice between the arts and sciences, and I went with the sciences. I could have done medicine, I could have gone to law, but I stopped with chemistry because to me, chemistry was like, you know, I should say, is like scuba diving with when then your baby, chemistry was in my blood. <laughs> No regrets whatsoever. And when I went to Jamaica, all the lecturers all over the world, including Prof. Das Gupta, may he rest in peace, from India, these guys would excite you and tell you to do projects as if, oh, we want to do a project on vitamin B12. But in true fact, it wasn't vitamin B12, but just to excite you. And, and those guys from England, all over the world, they really made us enjoy chemistry that we used to live in a lab and do sports. And they all made us feel welcome, even though we were foreigners in Jamaica. And that love, having good mentors, even mentors from Caltech, even mentors at ODU, really, really, really cemented my career in, in chemistry. Well, thank you for sharing your beautiful story. And what a, what a great way now that you, as an adult, have an opportunity then to inspire a future generation of chemists, just like you were inspired by some mentors. And what about you, Karina? What inspired you to pursue a career in STEM? It was a science. Sorry, uh, my parents, uh, my mom was a science teacher. And although after she got married, I had kids, she was not formally working. She was always tutoring kids while she was helping us doing uh, homework. And my dad is an engineer. So I guess I'm, I'm an engineer and I'm also teaching. So it's from both of them. Uh, he was always problem solving. He was repairing at home things. And I was his helper. And um, I want to say like all of my sisters were, but I mean, I was the main assistant and 
I guess my uncle, he was, he is a chemical engineer and I thought he was the smartest and the funniest person in the world and I wanted to be like him. So that's what I went to pursue my undergrad in chemical engineering. That's wonderful. And you know, I think everybody has a favorite uncle, uncle out there, right? So you know, it could be a teacher that inspired you. It could be another, um, it could be a neighbor. It could be somebody you met or it could also be one of your relatives. And now for our second question, which is, what do you think are some of the most pressing issues of diversity and inclusion in your field? And how do you think these are being addressed? And let's have Orlando answer this one. Uh, sure. Um, hi, everybody. How are you doing? Um, the most pressing issue is that we are underrepresented, definitely. Um, and there are, there are issues in your, common, in, in your daily work where you don't feel included. Um, it, it might not. I, I, at time, I, I I can see that sometimes it's not because somebody's doing it on purpose. It's just they're used to not to deal with other people. So it's not like they had their fault. It's the way they grew up, and uh, they were the the way they were raised. That that's how what that's how that's what they see. That's why they saw, uh, and they continue doing that. So they're not doing it on purpose. Uh, at least from my point of view, many of them are are not doing it on purpose. Um, how are we are how are we addressing those issues in in terms of diversity what we're doing is getting into any program possible to reach out to the kids to reach out to the to the young generation that's that's our source they are the ones that are going to come and here to help us in increasing the numbers because again uh, similarly as somebody treat us unfairly not maybe not because they want to just because they're used to they were raised that way um, what I'm afraid of is people of, on our side, they are not used to see us as scientists or engineers. So it's our job that we made it through. It's our job to tell them, hey, we're here. We made it. It wasn't, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't easy. We, it was hard, but we persist. And, and that's the key, persistency. I mean, it's always staying there and so on. In terms of inclusion, once you get into the field, you have to raise your voice. So, so people are, so people listen to you and that's how you, you start getting inclusion into this field. Um, once again, many of our colleagues are not doing it on purpose. Uh, they're, they're good colleagues and so on and so forth. And, and the moment we start stepping in, talking, not being quiet, but rather talking, being, being very respectful always. We have to be respectful and understand their backgrounds. As we want them to understand our background, we need to also understand their background, uh, and that's if we level if we reach to that level of res of respect, and and talking to them, being 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 clear or, or or not keeping your mouth shut. That's the that's the whole point. Just talk, and that's how I'm trying to address the inclusion part as well. That's very helpful. Now, Orlando, in your field of engineering, I know that there are several professional organizations for people of color, can you talk about some of that and basically how the field of engineering is trying to address the fact that there may not be as many underrepresented people in the field and they're really wanting to have greater diversity and more representation among their ranks. And it goes back to what I was saying before that we have to, we are getting involved in so many programs, but when I say programs, I also mean to, meant to say in many organizations that represent our our side, because it's not only people in color; it's also women. It's also it's also Latin American, although although Latin is also mixed with the people of colors as well in some cases. Uh, there are many organizations that that is, that do have professional level and student level, um, or, or student chapters, I should say, student chapter and professional chapters, and they are the ones reaching out. Those are another leg of the whole battle on reaching out this generation, because once again. The key here is reaching out the young generation. We are here, we made it through, but we need them to come and, and join us. And that's where we're here. That's it. See, proof of my of what we wanted to do on the, in terms of diversity inclusion is that we are all, all in this panel. So that's why that's why we're here as well to reach out to them, to reach out to you guys to who, who are listening to me. Right. And so basically, when students get to college and they're studying engineering. If you're of Latino descent or if you're of African American descent, for example, there are some professional organizations where you can, um, where you get to know other people with your backgrounds and experiences. And then I believe that they also host professional uh, 
the professional organizations also have conferences, right, where they encourage students right. to present. So there's a lot of opportunities for mm -hmm. students to get involved once they come to the university to basically help be represented in greater numbers in the field. Well, thanks for sharing that. And uh, Noru, what about you? What are, what are some of the pressing issues of diversity and inclusion in the field of uh, mathematics and statistics? And what, how is your field addressing these challenges? So thank you for the opportunities. Thank everyone for being part of this discussion. So I think it's very important that all the voices are heard just like uh, just like Orlando was saying, know that you are valued, even though we may not say it properly. We, we want to actually have your input and your, and your experience within each one of the research topics. So I like mathematics and statistics because it's all data related life and most of the things we are collecting nowadays is data related and data has, is very powerful in, can, in the in sense you can come up with predictions, you know, tell what tomorrow is going to be. Those are all very important for us, but also for the generation to come. So just like I said, I stand on the shoulders of others, you know, who have paved the road for us to be able to make it. And I, wish, I want to tell, you know, those young, you know, researchers and scientists, please stand on our shoulders, pick as much information as you can. You know, there's a group of us, you know, Alvin, one of them, doing a lot for undergraduate students. And I want to commend them, you know, for the work they have been doing and many, many, many others too. So don't be shy, just like, you know, it has been said earlier by, by Orlando, don't be shy into voicing your idea and know that we are valued. So by, by knowing that, your experience and your training can add a lot to the results that can come in the future. So these are issues I see, shyness is one of them. Please be proud and happy to get the hundred. Right? Don't don't you know? Don't be shy into getting a hundred. A hundred is very beautiful and very elegant. And by knowing, by doing that, you contributing to the general knowledge in science, in data, in mathematics. You know, whichever field you are interested in. So, science is a progression that is based on other discoveries, and you coming in board, you be adding a lot to the knowledge of all. So. Please, you know, be involved, know that your unique training is very much appreciated and don't be shy into, you know, stepping in and following whichever path you would like to consider. That's beautiful, thank you. And for question number three, why is diversity and inclusion so important in STEM? And we'll go ahead and keep talking with you, Noru. So I think you have a unique training, I tried to say earlier, and by having that training, you bring into the table something no one has thought of before. So again, if women, if minorities are not present in the table, I think many of the things we are discovering are not going to be as valuable. So we can see Katherine Johnson, we can see other people. Their contribution has been very significant in the progress, in the science level we are in nowadays. So again, don't think of this slightly. It's very important, it's very valuable. You know, don't be hesitant. Know that it, it might not be visible right now, but it's going to be very important for you to have to, to be part of these discoveries that are coming up. And, you know, more needs to be done. Think of COVID-19. Think of all the issues we are facing right now. And your contribution is very much needed. Why? Because you have a unique training, a unique point of view, a different perspective in each one of those problems and how to solve them. Again, together, we can make things happen. You know, don't be shy into thinking, oh, you know, they will discover it themselves. No, you have a unique way of solving problems. Please use that talent and from there participate as much as you can. Thank you. And what about you, Alvin? I know that you work with a lot of um, young students and you do some study abroad programs as well for research. Why is diversity and inclusion so important in STEM? And it's one of the things that you're dedica dedicated to improving and enhancing. What is so important about diversity and inclusion in this area? Well, I'll put the analogy, thanks for that question. I'll put the analogy, many of you guys are familiar that we in the West Indies play cricket. And unlike, you know, Jamaica has an athletic team, um, every Caribbean team, every Caribbean country has, has their own team about cricket. In the Caribbean is made up of 11 players from the English-speaking Caribbean. 
You know, we have different accents. We have different cooking, different cultures. Even though in the Caribbean, we speak different. Like Trinidadian speakers sing songs. So imagine those players are playing. It can be a lot of confusion. But all of them contribute with their talent. And if they put that talent and different cultures and different accents, the team wouldn't be so flamboyant and loved by all of the other cricket team countries from Asia, Australia, England, Hong Kong, you name it, Pakistan. So we have diversity. Guess what you bring? You bring more talent, excellent ideas. And for example, I read um, an article, which I probably have to share with you all at some point, that minorities are very, very innovative. Once you teach them, they will come and show some innovation on like people who are not minorities. I read that in the literature. And to be honest, when I went to, when I left Barbados, where we have, um, let's say, about 2% of our population is, of course, European descent. The rest is African descent. In Trinidad now, we have, believe it or not, 43% of Indian descent, 43 of African descent. And then you have the rest of the world. But when I went to Jamaica now, I was shocked to see, and people may not call me a whore, I would see someone who is Black, like a Black lady with Chinese eyes. Jamaica is, is very diverse. And believe it or not, everyone in Jamaica, regardless of their color, speak with a Jamaican accent, the part was recorded. And that country has produced many artists in reggae. So you see, they can be doing this thing. If we have people from all areas, uh, regardless of whether sexual orientation, different races, different um, different religions, different colors, and different, you know, everything is different. You can make a good team. Like in my, my, uh, my research group, six um, graduate students, undergraduates from different parts, all from different parts of the world, you will see they all love it. And when we have a potluck, oh my God, you should see the flavors and colors like curries and all the vegetables. So we do need to have diversity inclusion. If you have it, trust me, the world will be a better place, science will be better, and we'll have better innovations. And that's my point of view. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, I know that uh, when you, like, I grew up in Puerto Rico, right? And so I grew up around a lot of people that look like me, spoke like me. And when I came to the U.S. was the first time that I had the opportunity of being a minority or being underrepresented. And so being at ODU, I see a lot of the students that come in from all parts of the world. And you see when, you know, like, and you're even in your chemistry classes or other classes, people are broken down into teams. And you see how they approach problem solving and just the diversity of ideas that are generated because of their, you know, perhaps a past life experience or um, their backgrounds that is different from the others in the team. And so I always enjoy seeing the creativity of all the minds that come together through diversity and inclusion. And Orlando, I think I heard you trying to uh, jump in on the conversation. Yeah, I was going to say, but to put Karin on the spot because we've been working or I've been helping Karina. She, she's been leading that that those efforts in adding uh, why diversity and inclusion is so important in engineering. In terms of this, but I'm going to put Karina on the spot on this one because she's she's been working on that project. Please, You're, muted. You're muted. Oops, I can say something recently, not necessarily related to the class, but I wanted to say it on 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 this question. Because on uh, we had recently a program here at ODU that is the Early Engineering Advantage program that is for female engineering students or students that want to pursue engineering, and they do a presentation. And in the, one of those presentations, that's where I read this phrase that it says, "To engineer a better society, we need people of different genders and backgrounds solving out problems," and that's what we are trying to do in the in the class in in one ten the introduction to engineering class, where we give the importance of students to understand why diversity is important. If you ha have an all male team designing a car, they're designing it for males, and you realize that mortality in accidents for cars is higher for females because it's usually designed for uh, the, the, the typical male. So it's important. We're gonna have a better society when we have a diverse team trying to solve our problems. And when we see the perspective that someone different to us brings to the table, we are better able to come up with solutions and these solutions are gonna be better. So it's not only the, the process that is being improved by diversity, but also the product of that um, that we can come up with. 
when when I was that. when I was at Southern Mississippi, I was shocked to see the minorities and the non-minorities sitting separately. When we took those students to Jamaica and study abroad, and those students from, let's say, Wisconsin, Madison, the students in the north used to tease the students in the south about their accent. And this is in within the first days, and this is we were there for sixteen days, and as soon as they day four, when we had a project of painting a primary school or a family clinic, uh, planning family planning clinic, we were surprised to see they're all interrelated and did the paint job. Accents were forgotten, and they all became good friends. So, so study abroad really brings up, you know, something where students will grow up. Where the parents say, don't speak to this race, but when they go on a study abroad, see how they're becoming, they, they know that the, my, my, the minorities now, they, they have a different perspective. So study abroad and going and traveling really, really actually show the students what diversity and inclusion is all about. And if, yeah, what a wonderful recommendation for students to consider studying abroad, right, as part of their science. So there's a lot of study abroad opportunities can, that students can pursue to conduct research abroad and just really have that experience of other cultures and other people and other ways of thinking. Thanks for that. And so for our next question, we want to know what does it mean for people of color to have representation in the field? Um, and how has being a minority in your field um, shaped you? So for this one, Karina, can you take this one on? Sure. Um, so when I was young, I have to be completely honest, I was clueless about this. I mean, I was looking, lucky enough that I, the field I chose for my undergrad was not a majority male field. So I studied chemical engineering and it was half and half. And actually in my senior years or junior, there were majority female. So I, I didn't see that, that uh, underrepresentation, I guess, in, the term, in terms of gender. When I went to work on, there were few females, but I th I thought that as normal. Other majors, when I in my cohort, like in mechanical engineering, that cohort was so surprising because it was the first time that there were three girls in a class of seventy, and in in electrical engineering there were two. So like, oh, we, there are more women in, in in the whole school of engineering, except for for chemical engineering that was majority or well divided. I want to say. When I went to my graduate degrees, that was when I noticed because my graduate degrees are in mechanical engineering and material sciences, and mechanical engineering is mainly uh, male. That's what that was when I started noticing things, but I still saw that as normal. And I went to the University of Texas at El Paso for my graduate degrees, which is a Hispanic-serving institution. So I didn't see that issue regarding race. So I was kind of like clueless and protected in a way, but uh, I guess it was through blissful ignorance that in a way didn't shape me, but, but protected me. And I was mature enough that when I grew up, like it wasn't until I moved to a not a Hispanic serving institution when I started noticing these, um, these issues or where I'm a professor in, in engineering and I see that only 70% of our students are female. And because ODU has mainly the um, male majority fields like mechanical engineering or electrical or civil. Civil engineering right now is the one that has more females. But now it's when I'm starting to notice uh, more things and I can be more involved in, in this, being more of a role model, being more actively participating in events that can help uh, attract minorities, not only females, but Hispanics. So in a way, I, when I was young, I was gonna say I was clueless and that protected me. And now that I'm more mature, I understand these issues and I, and I see them with a different lens. You know, it's interesting to see how those experiences shaped you to who you are today. And now you're actually doing work to attract students um, of color also into the STEM field. And what about you, Noru? And I believe you're muted, so we may not be able to hear you. Do you mind unmuting your mic? Yeah, there we go. So I think, you know, I usually think that media doesn't do a good job in portraying the contribution of minorities. And again, I would not rely on media, but know that there are, you know, some 
some some links. And one of them is that, you know, you, minorities are gifted. In fact, there's a there's a link for, you know, mathematically gifted blacks. And you look at it, you'll see the contribution of many minorities. And I want to say that please, you know, contact them, reach out to them, don't be shy, look at their experience, learn from as many as possible, you know, those members. So there's a great contribution that is being made by minorities. Of course, it's not going to be, you know, displayed on the face front of, of media. But again, as minority, I usually look out for those kind of people. What are they doing? How much research involvements are they, you know, conducting? And once I do it, I, I see amazing stories, you know, people who have come so far and have contributed so much. And what I want to say is that we, each one of us can make a contribution. Just like I said earlier, I stand on the shoulders of others, you know, using their research, using the ideas they have built and trying to improve it. Look at what others have been doing. Please, if something of interest is of interest regarding what I'm doing, what, you know, any of the other researchers are doing, don't be hesitant to contact them. A simple email questioning, you know, or asking, can you explain it a bit more? That's what we are here for. We are not just, you know, researchers, but we are also educators. And we'll be very happy to share the research we are doing with you. Because again, we think, you know, by being higher education levels, you can contribute a lot more and a lot faster with your experience. Know that it's valuable and we value it. We may not say it properly or I may not say it in a proper way, but you, you have to be confident that we value the research, the STEM field you are in. So STEM, I usually think is beautiful. You know, it's, it's very beautiful and useful. So stick in, stick in the STEM field and try to do the best you can. Maybe uh, minority in your field now or in your school, but once you start working at some of these large research organizations like NASA or the Jefferson Lab, they're going to attract scientists like you who are top in their field from all over the world. And it really is a beautiful thing to work in that environment and be able to collaborate and come up with some really great discoveries and transform the world. Um, so for our next question, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in your career and how did you over overcome them? And I'm going to uh, go to Orlando for this one. So let me see. Uh, yeah, I have, I have the mic on. I have had to give full disclosure as Karina. So I grew up in Venezuela, and of course, in Venezuela, we look alike in terms of colors and all that. And so when you go to to college, you also see same, the same the same population. It's the same population. We also see that. So I didn't see um, a difference among my peers when I was getting trained in my in mechanical engineering career. It was when I came to the United States when I noticed the difference, um, but not because I felt people treating me differently, just because I saw that there are differences, that are clear differences that, are, that I was that I was in, in the middle of a, of a room that people looked like me differently. Now, the key, and, and, and be, maybe because I, I grew up in that environment that I didn't see that difference, that's, that's what allowed me to feel confident when I arrived here because I made it through. So, and I was proud of, of, what, I, of, what, I, of what I accomplished. So I didn't feel separated from the group. Now, the other thing, as many of my colleagues will know, is that I, I tend to talk. I'm not going to be the shy one say, staying in the corner. If I say some, if I see something wrong, I'll speak out. And I, that's going to take me back to what I said before. Do not shy away. Speak out. I know some, some of you might be shy. Believe me, I used to be a shy person. I still, I'm still a shy person right now, but not as much as, as I was when I was a, a teenager or when I get when I got to when I got to my college at time. Um, but the key here to on how to overcome challenges, or perhaps perhaps I have I, I had my challenges, but I didn't feel like challenges because I I always in the face of opposition you go forward, you don't stop, and you might fail. That's perfectly fine, but the point is not to stop because you fail. Fail failing is the opportunity to start again, rather than to stop. 
failing doesn't mean that you have to stop this to stop what what it means that you have to start all over again that's it as simple as that you gotta move forward and that's how i address what we consider what i could consider challenges in my life i've been blessed with with my career i've been blessed with the many people i've been surrounded with um i'm not gonna say that i that has been a a garden of roses along the way but but i i made it through by not not giving up if i fail that's okay. I'll continue. And by speaking up, I never, I never keep my, kept my mouth shut. Never. Those are certainly some great takeaways to, you know, speak up. Don't be afraid to fail and never give up. Those are wonderful. Thank you for sharing those. And Elvin, um, can you speak to us about some mentors and role models that have made a significant impact in your life? I know that Elvin, you started telling us a little bit of a story of a mentor, but can you tell us about one mentor in particular that really made a, a difference in your life? Oh, <laughs> I've had a lot. But I would say Mr. Shea, who took off the old Shea until, you know, his daughters had back old Shea when he passed away. But Mr. Shea, who taught me chemistry from the time was third form right through until sixth form. He from Ireland, you know, Caucasian, married to a lady of African descent and Barbie's children were, I should say, mixed as well. I thought to his daughter's chemistry, ironically. And he really, really, really helped me, prepared me to be stronger mathematically. I wasn't strong in mathematics, but I was strong in chemistry. I can solve every problem in chemistry with mathematics, but I can understand mathematics. This is strange, right? And he worked on me. And even my first year in university, because you know when you have a teacher, they'll, they'll do everything for you. When you go to university, you're on your own making up solutions. So I would call him, I said, sir, they asked me to, to make up these solutions and you know, everything was prepared and he would help me. And even when, even when I was at university, he, he and I taught university, he would see me say, you know, Alvin, you still got those rough edges in you. <laughs> <laughs> I just still have rough edges because, you know, we went, we went at a, a rough school in Barbados where they would put you when, you when you're first term in a call for the five of us as little boys, you know, 11 year olds and all that. Oh boy. Get you, you know, and that would that would help you, you know, with, with the students from all different races slap at your head. And he would try to protect me. And he told me, he believe it or not, he used to give me some chemicals to take home to try experiments. You know, there's a no no in the United States. I would go to the chemist, which of course are pharmacists in Barbados, and buy the hydrochloric acid, I would make the stick bombs and and stop classes, not his. <laughs> so he really was a good mentor. He would teach me and give me some books to read. And another thing about it was that before he came to the Caribbean, he wanted to be a priest in Trinidad. He came with the bars and become a teacher. He had an influence on all of us, including some younger students today that speak highly of him. When I got in my first faculty position in the United States, my was brought in Barbados. I got it in, in um, February 2006. He passed with Francis um, Cicero cancer because he told me he had cancer. I sent back my periodic tie to his daughter so that he can bury him with it. And he really, really, really was a really good role model that taught me how to be, let's say, say polite, you know, culture be that I would be like a big bull in a China store, <laughs> you know, rough, rough edges. And he really made an influence. And to be honest, I wouldn't have known chemistry without him. And then his, his um, other teacher who taught me organic chemistry, who taught us about how to treat ladies while he was teaching chemistry. So those two were like always one. One was a Rastafarian, one was a Caucasian, <laughs> and not me. I would speak about Mrs. Shea being the more influential of the two. Well, that's great. Thanks for sharing those stories. And it sounds like all of us could use mentors like that, right? That really help you, right? Strengthen in the subject areas where maybe perhaps you're not as strong Absolutely. and then also encourage you to not give up. And then at the end, also, if they see something that maybe you need direction on, they, they're not afraid to, to call you and say, hey, listen, you should perhaps work better on this. Um, and just knowing that they're always there for you, no matter what level of your career you're in. So thanks for sharing that. Especially like a coach too, because mentors who are really good will tell you like it is. People, everybody's here in the United States, people don't like you to tell them directly. But me, 
I love when people tell me when weaknesses, I can correct them. And that, that's how they are doing PRD. They weren't afraid to speak their minds because they right. the meant good. That's right. And so, I have more than one mentor, as you say. More than one. Many mentors. <laughs> and now you're a mentor to students too. So see how uh, you've been able to pass on that legacy too. Um, so for question seven, I'd like to uh, go back to Noru. And what is one piece of practical advice that you would give to your old self that is someone starting uh, first starting out? So try to think back of when you were first starting out to the age of some of the attendees that we have joining us from around the globe today. And they're, you know, may not know right now, like maybe they want to study in your field, but they're not sure if they're able to, or, you know, maybe they're doubting themselves. So what is some, a piece of practical advice that you would give to your old self if you can look back and knowing the things that you know now in your career? Not, you're muted again. <laughs> Hi again. Yes. So I think communication is very important. Know what you want and stick to it. There's a pleasure in doing science. You know, it will come along the way. Don't be shy, you know, into pursuing what you like. I think, you know, I would say communication is one piece of advice, right? So don't be, don't be shy to exchange your ideas with others. You know, maybe one person might not like it. But again, try it, you know, with other person. If, of course, they mention that we need to refresh or rewrite it in a different way, you know, I would say take their advice and go back and redo it. The idea is to never give up, you know. So the reward is going to be there. And it takes long time and effort in order to get any of those things. So don't give up, you know, you know and, and, and the reward is going to come. And again, enjoy it because science is beautiful. That's how I say it. It has always been the contribution of science is tremendous. The way I see it is that wherever you look at science is there. You know, so please, you know, if we are you know, lucky, if we are lucky to be part of science, I would say we should foster, we should nurture that opportunity and, and grow with it. And Karina, what would you tell your old self if you were starting out now looking back on your career? I guess uh, related to being uh, being a minority, I would say that you always be proud of my background, of your background, and understand that sometimes uh, rude actions from from others or comments from others are. It's not, it's not personal. It's a reflection of the other person. Most of the time, I mean, if, if you do something that you take responsibility of, of what you do, but something that is out of context, it's not about you. Don't take anything per personal uh, with respect to that. In the other practical advice, again, I will say the same as Naru, communication is very important. So it's important to learn how to communicate with others and with everybody with different backgrounds, different levels. So that's something really important. And looking back at all your career, if you look at your young self and you know trying to inspire others who are watching this broadcast, what would you tell those young people? Um, what is some career advice that you would have for them if you were just starting all over again? I will say that be fearless. Like, or don't be shy to overcome your peers because you're always going to be afraid of something afraid of making a mistake or afraid of reaching out to other people do it do it even if you're afraid of of, of what may happen what may happen maybe things turn out okay so have a, a positive attitude about overcoming those fears about reaching out to, to others i think at the end good things happen you just have to get things moving I really like what you said, because sometimes when people criticize you, right, it might be more of a reflection of them on you. And so it's hard to hear the words, oh, don't take it personally, right? Because it feels like somebody's making a personal statement about you. But the reality is, is that you need to, um, you know, try to continue and moving ahead because um, you may have a difficult time in school right now, right? Or in your high school, um, there might be people that are different from you and may make comments to you, but but know that if you keep studying hard and if you keep looking for opportunities to do research or even contacting uh, researchers like the panelists that you have on right now or faculty members, 
they're there to help you, to listen to you and to help guide you. And so you're really not alone. That is one, that's one advice that I would have, right? You're not alone and you can be inspired to be like the panelist and overcome difficulties and know that in the end, you might end up having a wonderful career in STEM. And so, like you said, be fearless and just kind of keep going. Don't let what people tell you that you can or can't do stop you because in the end, um, with hard work and with perseverance, you, you can accomplish a lot of greatness. Yes, as Orlando said, persistence is also very important in STEM. It sure is. And for our next question, we have, um, what support systems are needed in your field to support and retain more people of color? And so Alvin, what are your thoughts on this? In the field of chemistry, um, what are some support systems that you think are needed in order to retain more people of color? Um, for example, do you think that there should be more opportunities for internships or um, for grants that uh, help fund research? What are some of the ideas that you have for support systems? I, that's a good question. I think the more important is that you really need um, just like the Mark program. There, there's one called ST for freshmen and sophomores. The market which is going to become U-Rise for juniors and seniors. They have G-Rise, which are more for graduate students. And before, I should say, PhD students, and then there's one called for master's, which is called bridges to the doctorate. And there's one that if students, when they're just graduate as a senior, there's one called post-baccalaureate um, sessions, where you can do research for two years to prepare you for grad school. And then there's one called IRTA, which is more for Grad students who then want to become postdoctoral fellows to be trained to the faculty. But I think that the support system should be started from the upper administration, the, you know, the president and the provost and the dean of each colleges, where they should have um, a set of money set aside for even if you can't get the grants, you should put aside that money for training. Um, minorities. And when I say minorities, I will include underrepresented students too, just not minorities too, because they're right. classified as well. And more so students who are disabled. I noticed that we don't have a lot of students who are, you know, deaf and blind here or do you? Like, for example, um, Rochester Institute of Technology, they have a, a downloaded um, science program there for students who are deaf. And University of Delaware, they have some are you for students who are disabled. So, so I think is that you need to have that. You need to have um, like in Mrs. Lisa Mays, you know, the, the CHIP program. The CHIP is very important. And I will say too is that, is that we should have, like, I know we don't have a lot of endowments, but we should have some special money certified for postdoctoral fellows who are minorities where they can come and do cutting edge research and prepare them for them. Because more important is that we need more minorities in the STEM at ODU. I understand now there's 7% of us who are African descent here at ODU. That is not good. And then we have nearly probably 7% that is Hispanic and American Indians probably less than 1%. That is not good. But more important is that the support system is is needed to have people who are collegiate and not don't play us. We have the same brain, we breathe the same oxygen and that we should be treated with respect to serious someone who is not a minority. And that is very important is that we should be heard and that when we speak, we should be, we should be listened to and not cut short. <laughs> so, so respect is one of the most important things is to treat everyone equally even the students too, don't downgrade the students. Even if they get a 2.5 GPA or below three, we should do everything to build them up and it should, and shouldn't prevent them from doing research. Because if you, if you turn them off, they're gonna be turned off and they, they're gonna tell their friends as well. Well, thanks for sharing that. And so um, at Old Dominion, for example, there are some support systems in place for uh, students in terms of um, if you need support with math, um, or any of the sciences, there's tutoring opportunities available for students. So that's definitely one support system. And then um, in the summer times, I know that some of you who are joining us uh, have been asking a lot about some of the experiential opportunities or even research opportunities that we offer. And so we do offer some undergraduate research experiences. So we encourage you to look online 
Um, that's definitely a support system um, that's needed in the field of science to encourage underrepresented students to, to come to the university and to make sure that they're enrolling in these fields and further to help advance the, the research. And so there are a lot of um, support systems in place, but as Alvin mentioned, um, we can also continue to do so much better to support um, all students and so we can uh, retain more people of color. And so those are always uh, very important reminders. And I'm gonna take a moment here to remind our audience- hey, to Joanna, sorry, be before you move on to the next question, let me just add something on top of what you're saying in regarding the previous question that I, I agree with Alvin, there are more opportunities to create more support systems, especially for professionals like us and so forth. And, and, but when it comes to, to students, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities uh, for them to get support. What happens is that they don't know about them. Um, and that will, will take me back to what I was saying before is speak out. And I, and I maybe perhaps I made a mistake saying before, don't be shy. I, I shouldn't say that because when I was shy, I was shy, period. It's not like, oh, I'm going to switch my, I'm, I'm going to turn my switch to the non-shy person today. That's not going to happen. If you are a shy person, that's okay. That is perfectly fine. But you, you try to push yourself just a little bit. You'll see how Karina, uh, how Karina mentioned before is that um, great things come out of those efforts of trying. Speak out, talk, ask questions. If and that will take me to question number seven, which which I just gonna mention that if I have to tell something to my to my young myself, I will say, ask question. I used to not ask any question to anyone and kept everything to myself. Ask questions. Even if you think it's, a, it's a, what some people might believe is a silly question, there is no silly question. Silly is not asking the question. So talk, find out, talk to people. People will tell you things. So the support system, some of them are in place. But granted, yes, we need more. But there are few that are exist that, that those are the ones that Giovanna was talking about. And that's a beautiful, no, your, your point about asking questions is a beautiful transition because I was just about to remind our audience that we would love to hear from you via our live chat. So if you haven't already taken a moment to ask questions, please go ahead because in just a few minutes, we are going to go answer live questions from our audience and we would love to know your name, where you're joining us from, as well as what question you would like to ask of these um, scientists that may be the future you in the future. Um, and so when we go to question nine, um, we were talking about what, uh, basically like what has helped you get to where you are um, and what advice would you give to others who want to set off in a similar direction? So uh, Noru, if you can share with us, what, what advice would you give to people who are hoping to head into your field and um, how early should they start pursuing some of the opportunities of research and inquiry in, the, in, in STEM? So the advice is to never give up. Again, you know that you are in a field that is very attractive. You can make a very great you know, impact, not only to your community, but to the whole world. And uh, so again, it's not going to be easy, but there are lots of resources around. You know? And I think you can tap on those resources, just like you know, the panel has stated. The resources are, are here. Please ask questions, communicate. Juggling family and education is not always easy, but know that we are part of your family. You know, that's how I see myself here at ODU. So we are here to help and we are open to, to you know, to, to helping anyone interested, you know, looking for help. And don't be shy. Mm -hmm. How early do you recommend that people start doing it? Because I know that there are some high schoolers who are joining us and they're they're really interested in in starting early. And so are there opportunities for high school students, maybe at their local high school or, or if they take a class, um, for example, at ODU in the summer, are there opportunities for research? So I think there are opportunities. You just have to connect with the professor you are interested in working with. And uh, it, don't wait till university or till you finish such and such to start your research. As long as you have something of interest, communicate it with you know, the interested persons and the group can be starting and you can produce some work. Yeah. When, when I was at primary school, um, the days where we, were really, we didn't have television, but there was something called a radio fusion, you know, cable radio. There was something called 
Science for Juniors. We were introduced this long before we were nine. Science for Juniors. And they used to mix up things to, you know, you know, you know, children love, they're very inquisitive. We'll take the tadpoles and see them grow into frogs. We'll catch the butterflies and put them in the spider's web, you know what happened then. But but before it was for my granduncle used to clean the pig's tie. I would be around him all the time. He used to work on a plantation. He used to say, Well, you keep asking me a lot of questions. You're gonna be a lawyer. So so being in, you know inquisitive, inquisitive. If you got people who love an inquisitive child and give them what they want, they'll love it. But we we do have a system where we help high school students from um, Brandy High School. And we brought men one time to extract DNA from strawberries. When I was in Mississippi, we brought in the high school students and we had them to make juice, electricity from sunlight using the you know the blackberries and and some some tin dioxide and made those and they were amazed. And you can do that to excite these these students from primary school, even from the time they're two. Show them color changes, you know, with the uh, the dyes from cabbage. Show them color changes or separate chlorophyll from from you know using chromatography with just a filter paper by some leaves, and they will be inquisitive and show them how tadpoles can become frogs. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful story. And um, so regards are, we are starting to get some questions from our live audience. And so we have two questions from students in Puerto Rico. The first is, what advice do you have for raising your voice? And I believe Orlando, you were the one who talked about the importance of raising your voice. What is some advice you have for students? The, the most, am I, yeah, I have the mic on. So the most important thing is to realize when you when you are a child person that that that's the one part that it will stop you a little bit. Um, but again, I, I'll, I'll come back to what what I said before and 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 what what Karina mentioned. Great things comes out of after after you push yourself. Uh, I remember the one of the biggest challenges that I have is when I came to the United States. Uh, I was freaking out the whole trip. And, and I remember when my dad took me to the airport, I was the whole time in muted, didn't talk to any to anyone. But yet, it wasn't like I, I was going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. I decided not to stop. I continued. So going back to, the, to your question, I, I believe one of the things that stopped many of us is being shy. Um, and you, be, you start realizing that you're not that shy once you start speaking out, just Try yourself. Try one time. Don't don't push yourself too too hard, because I know it's difficult. Like I told you years ago, I, I used to be a shy person to the point that I never asked a question. Uh, but I, but but see, you just take one step at a time. Don't don't rush it because you're not gonna be the the speaker to to a hundred people in front of you. You'll be just talking to one person. Take one step at a time. Try try, and you'll see you'll see you'll succeed. If it's something that you're hoping to do, you could always try practicing in front of your family or one of your friends, and then you take that courage and, and do it in a larger group and present. And I see Alvin is wanting to also answer this question. When I, when I was in sixth form, we went to a different school called Prevert Street. We were students from different schools who come to Grand School with me. And I went to this school, and I was, I, you know, there's this, there's this young lady who was born in England. You know how those English girls speak with. English accent, speak like the Queen. And she told me one time, listen, I know you're shy. Look at me in the eyes and talk. And from that point, <laughs> you know, a lady just tell me, a student, a female student told me, just stop it. If you like me, tell me you like me. And from that point, I just changed my <laughs> shy person. So always have someone who can point out to you and just channel you, you know, right. whether they're younger or older than you or whatever sex or whatever they are. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and then we have a question, Noru, I was hoping that maybe you can chime in and help us. And that is how, um, what are some scholarships that might be available to students wanting to study in STEM? So ODU has many scholarships, you know, especially for undergraduates too. And uh, the federal government, US, you know, the US has lots of scholarships available. And I usually think that your hard work is the best scholarship you can give to anyone, to yourselves. So I grew up in Senegal and, uh, you know, being top of the students is actually very, very rewarding because people will notice you even, even though 
you might not see the value you are bringing. So keep working hard and give it your 110% best. The reward is going to come. So I, of course, got the support of my family, my uncle, you know, so all of them participate greatly in my success. But I cannot, uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, I, I have to value also the support I receive from many other professors. And, you know, so some of them are colleagues now. And just like I said, they are still mentors to me. I still can't reach out to them and see. But please remember, you know, you have resources, special at ODU, available for minorities. Please communicate your issues, whatever they may be, and know that getting 100 is actually very elegant, especially in science. Thank you for sharing that. I know that um, our session has come to an end, and so we do want to thank all of our panelists for participating today and for sharing your insights and hopefully for inspiring the young minds out there who are watching and hoping to become you one day. As you have heard from our panelists, you know, it doesn't matter what challenge you have, you can overcome those challenges and be inspired to pursue a career in STEM. So we do need more people like you. And I hope that through the Reyes program and all the sessions and the panel today that you are inspired to continue doing what you're doing, continue being curious, and one day you might make that wonderful discovery um, for yourself. And so I do, before we part, I do want to again thank all of our uh, distinguished panelists for taking your time to talk with us today. And um, for those of you that we are not able to answer your questions, we will be sure to um, post some question and answers to our site. And I do want to remind you that tomorrow we have some wonderful sessions coming up. We have the ODU dubbed in Spanish, sin sus titulos, at 2 o'clock. We have at 3 o'clock, unconscious bias, recognizing personal bias and how it impacts others. And then at 4 p.m., we have session one of two of a very special uh, session that's on coronavirus simulation with gaming technologies. So please stay tuned to the Reyes content, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.